Matt's on vacation, so we're having a party. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I am David Hansen, joined by Patrick Morris. Thanks for having me, David. Great to be here. Patrick is a contributor for Fool.com, covering <clears throat> banks, Warren Buffett, Student uh, loans, everything? Yeah, anything and what everything. What is one thing you do not cover for Fool.com? One thing I do not cover for Fool.com, that would definitely be any, pretty much anything related to energy companies. Ooh. Natural gas, oil, petroleum. Ladies all, fitness? Ladies fitness, all kind of a mystery to me. We'll get you there. Okay, one day. All one right, day. Uh, let's hit the first headline. This is actually from last Friday, Yeah, I think. last Friday. Looking at Visa and MasterCard, it's from the Wall Street Journal. MasterCard and Visa forming group to focus on payment security. All right, we obviously talked about the Target breach, the Nordstrom breach. It was Nordstrom, right? Uh, I believe it was Neiman Marcus. Neiman Marcus, there yep. we go, yep. Neiman Marcus. Uh, so now we have Visa and MasterCard coming out and saying, hey, we gotta make some changes. What are they saying we should do? Yeah, so it's a really interesting initiative. The, the two credit card companies are, are forming this group that's gonna include banks and credit unions, and they're really just po uh, pushing for enhanced security across the payment landscape, mm -hmm. whether it be uh, certain technologies and the cards themselves or the uh, uh, data processing and the means by which they do that, mm -hmm. it's, it seems really interesting. Yeah, and one of the things they point out in the article is the embedded chip technology, mm -hmm. which you were telling me before, you've talked to people in the industry saying, this is commonplace around the world, except the United States. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I remember seeing one graphic, uh, there was a, a map of exactly that, the entire world, mm -hmm. and they showed that essentially every other country where uh, credit cards are the primary means by which people make purchases, they have this EMV technology that really embeds secure transactions mm -hmm. and ensures that you know what happened in the example of Target is essentially impossible, and really the United States is one of the only areas in the world where that isn't common use. Right. And one of the issues behind that was you had the banks on one side and then the retailers on the other saying, well, we're just going to wait for the other party to make yeah. the initiative here. And what the retailers are saying, we're going to wait for the banks to do that with the cards. And then the banks are saying, well, the retailers, it's their problem. Like They need <laughs> yep. to be worried about the, the, about the fraud here. Uh, so it's interesting to see that Visa and MasterCard are trying to step in and saying, all right, guys, you both have to do this because otherwise we're all going to suffer. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was I'm giving them credit for this, and I've been one to say that I'm a little bit not worried about their market position, but mm -hmm. with things like Bitcoin, with things like digital payments, their competitive moat, you could say, was shrinking a little bit. Yeah. And they're coming out and saying, no, we need to stay with the times here. We need to stay on top of this so we don't get supplanted by some other type of technology. Yeah, it's really fascinating because you hear all these rumors of companies like Google and Amazon perhaps exploring payments technology mm -hmm. and as a consumer when you think like, okay, well maybe if I swipe my, my credit or debit card there's a risk here, you would seemingly likely be more willing to try something else if, you're, if you believe it's gonna be a more secure means to make right. a transaction. And so I think it's really interesting that they're coming together and saying, no, we're going to tackle this issue head on. Although we're competitors, we also understand that our business is essentially, they have the, same business. Yeah, essentially yeah. the same. What happens to one happens yeah, to the other. Exactly. Basically. So it makes sense that they would partner together and, and really try and push for greater security to give their consumers greater comfort in yeah. using the, the payment system. So going to the shares of Visa and MasterCard, yeah. obviously. Both have been incredible oh, since they've... Incredible run. <laughs> exactly. And you're shaking your head because you don't own shares of any of these companies. You haven't in the past, and I don't either. Yep. And ne neither of us have benefited from the great runs in the stock price here. Yeah. So the question is, why don't we own them? What will it take for us to, to own these shares? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me personally, I, I, I think that... Uh, I, one of the things I always look at is perhaps it's from the Warren Buffett School, just in Ben Graham, value investing. Mm -hmm. And when you look at those two stocks, I mean, they are just really expensive. And, you know, on, on any really quantifiable and discernible measure, mm -hmm. like, man, this is a, a pricey institution. So there is some hesitancy in just diving right in and saying, yeah. okay, this is a great business, but at the same time, it's also a, a ra rather expensive stock. Yeah, and I mean, and they've shown time and again that they've been expensive in the past, but the performance has outpaced the expectations that were maybe even seemed high at the time. Yeah. Um, the one thing I would caution is you look at these shares, they've basically gone in a straight line up since they've been public, both yep. of them. 
What you don't want to do is just say, I can't take it anymore. They keep going up. I'm just going to buy them. That's yeah. what makes sense. That's what you don't want to do. You don't want to just throw your hands up in the air and say, valuation doesn't matter. I'm just going to buy, the, buy this company. And whether it's Visa or MasterCard, that's when you get into some trouble and get into a business that you don't understand at a valuation that you don't really comprehend either. Yeah, absolutely. All right, moving on to our focus for the day. Talking a little student loans here. Yeah. Uh, this is a space, like I said, that, that you cover a little bit. One of the things we always hear, <clears throat> student loans, it's the next crisis. Yep. It's crippling the youth of the country. We have nowhere to go. Is it really a full-blown crisis? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I certainly think there, there are some alarming data points and things you could look at, whether it be one of the, the headline numbers, of course, is that the total student loan balance has ballooned over $1 trillion, mm -hmm. which is really a, a kind of a terrifying number. It's gone from being, you know, a, certainly a, a portion of de household debt to now, I want to say like, I think like a quarter of non, you know, mortgage, mortgage debt. related debt is in student loans. So it's, it's, it's really ballooned, but it's also really important to remember here that, that the, the number of students going into college is going up, um, you know, so kind of on a relative basis that it's, it's not quite as extreme. Yeah, yeah. So you have the trillion dollar number, but you have a lot more people into that number. So right. it's on, a, on a per student basis or per borrower basis, it's not as extreme as just kind of the overall growth of the volume here. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And two, uh, one of the, the, a really interesting thing done by the Pew Research Center recently was they said, they just showcased the rising cost of not going to college. Mm. And I, they showcased that in the, the silence generation, so these are people born between 1925 and 1942, mm. they had, the average salary of someone on a, on a real basis, so this factors in inflation, all of those associated yep. things, was 39000 for someone with a degree and 34000 for someone without a degree. So pretty close. So relatively close. And these are people born between 1925 and 42. Right. And then the millennials, uh, the most recent generation, the gap there has now ballooned. But for someone with a college degree, their average salary is forty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So up, you know, about about twenty five percent or so from people yeah. that now have a college degree to people without a college degree, it stands at thirty thousand wow. dollars. So on a relative basis, the gap has ballooned from being just six thousand dollars a year to or excuse me, five thousand dollars a year to now fifteen thousand right. dollars. And you wrote an article that the headline was the one thing more expensive than than going to college is potentially not going to college. Exactly. Um, and in terms of looking out at the institutions here, on kind of the same same tones of, of student loans, we have the for-profit institutions, the private mm -hmm. colleges, and you also did some digging into this. Um, the CFPB is looking into some of these for-profit institutions and seems a little troubling. And I've said, I've said in the past that you don't want to mess with the CFPB. They're a new organization, but they seem to be pretty gung-ho about finding stuff and taking care of it. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great point. So they announced just last week that they're attacking ITT, or not even attacking, they're really just diving into their business practices, mm -hmm. and they, they highlighted a, num a number of reasons for the suit that they brought against them. Uh, and one of the really interesting things is, so they're seeking restitution, fines, and injunctions. So they're attacking them from pretty much every they're angle. saying, we're gonna take everything. Yeah, yeah, or they're yeah. trying to. <laughs> and so they, they highlighted that one of the problems was ITT, they, they really pushed their students into just risky loans mm -hmm. where they, they had them tried. So one of the really interesting things was the average uh, annual wages of someone coming into ITT was only around $18,000 a year. But the average cost for a four-year degree at ITT was $88,000 a year. Doesn't seem to be a good balance No, there. and so in this, they, they highlighted that really in, the only way by which students could effectively get an education at ITT was mm -hmm. taking on these very risky student loans that paid out at astronomical interest rates. And they really, I mean, th they did a, just kind of a, a, a troubling job of mm -hmm. pushing students into risky right. debt. And, and, and you see that in the results. One of the numbers that you pointed out was over 30% yeah. of loans for ITT are 
in default. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, and it's just, it's truly troubling when you think that, you know, these are loans that, that people think, oh, this is this is really the, the next step in my life. Like, it's gonna be this, this wonderful transition. And I mean, we see the absolute need, as we talked about earlier, for people to go to college. And, yeah you know, the rising gap there, but then you have these for-profit institutions and they're really just seeking to, they're not seeking to educate students as their principal goal, they're publicly traded companies. Mm -hmm. So they're seeking to return capital to their shareholders, right. which means making money. Right, so it sounds like stepping back at looking at the student loan crisis, mm -hmm. quote unquote crisis, if we're gonna call it that, maybe it doesn't seem to be as widespread as kind of everyone wants to say, everyone with a student loan is gonna default and it's a terrible mm -hmm. thing but it, there does seem to be some pockets of some troubling situations here. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, you look at a company like ITT, one, it, so they're going after their, their student loans, but they're also like, the problem is the education where they're saying like, you know, tr credits can't transfer or anything of that mm -hmm. sort. So really, I think you're absolutely right. I think college is a wonderful thing. And, you know, there are certainly, certainly troubling bits and pockets, like yeah. you said, but on the whole, it's a great thing. Um, but certainly when you have people that are, not acting in the best interest of the student, then yeah. it's a little bit troubling. All right, very interesting. All right, we're gonna move on to the mailbag. We have an email address, WTMI at fool.com. Yep. Our question today is this. It's from, who's it from? It's from Sam. Sam. He says, Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway is often mentioned on the show and I myself am a longtime investor in the company. Buffett has historically said that he has no plans for a dividend. From my understanding, the reason is Hold on, we lost the question. Can we get the question? There we go. <laughs> the reason is that he likely can allocate the capital better than I can. This is something that I do not dispute. The size of the company was mentioned in Friday's podcast, and it was ultimately concluded on the show that Berkshire could still slightly outperform the market. My question is, at what point, if ever, does it make sense for the company to begin issuing a dividend? How much larger can the company continue to grow where it doesn't make sense to return some capital to shareholders? And again, that's a question from Sam. Thanks for the question, Sam. Like I said, Patrick, he covers Buffett. That's why we have him here. <laughs> Buffett has said in the past that he's not planning on paying a dividend anytime soon, right? Correct. Yeah, I think I think in the you know forty-five year history that he's been at the helm of Berkshire, they've paid it one quarter. Yeah. Or so. And he likes to say he do, he's like, I don't think I was in the room for that decision. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny little so quote from him. With, with his priorities of capital, just stepping back, what are What's Buffett's kind of checklist? Yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, first and foremost, I mean Berkshire Hathaway, we cover it here in the financial sector, but I mean they have you know they have energy businesses, yeah. manufacturing everything, and really first and foremost and principally on that list is reinvesting back into those businesses, whether it involves um, you know certain initiatives with uh, Burlington Northern Santa yeah. Fe, and you know. I, I don't really know much about railroads, but I, certainly probably like, a lot of investment needed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And same thing. I again don't know much about energy, but I'm sure that there are always things that they need to explore. And really, they believe that they can return or make greater returns to yeah. shareholders by enhancing their yeah. great businesses. Yeah, and then the the second thing would be just going out and buying companies that are yep. attractive, and then we have buying back their own shares yep. at the right price. And then he said, well, then maybe I'll considered yeah. of that. But to answer his question, if it ever gets to a point, I think it's possible, anything's possible, but I think there would have to be some very extreme circumstances for him to do that. Because like you said, he would have to look at the businesses that Berkshire Hathaway has, and they would have to say, okay, it doesn't make sense for us to invest capital here. We don't think we can get a good return for our shareholders here. Yep. With the amount of businesses under their umbrella, I have a hard time believing that they are having a, a tough time finding places to put the money, right? Yeah. Um, and then I think the other half of that equation would have to be the overall market. Market valuations would have to be insane that Buffett could not find any deals anywhere that interested him. Mm -hmm. So both of those things happening, I think are pretty, the market could get overvalued. We know that that's Absolutely. likely. Absolutely. But combining that with not being able to reinvest in the business at all yeah. just seems very, very unlikely. And even after Buffett's, Buffett's gone, I think the culture that they've instilled there is dividends almost a, uh, like a last resort option here. I mean, yeah. with the people that he's been breeding there as his lieutenants, I think they all agree with him that dividends probably aren't the best use for Berkshire. Yeah, yeah, and I couldn't agree more with you. And I, I think too, 
you know, one of the compelling things he's written about is, you know, perhaps if you're looking for a dividend from Berkshire Hathaway, I forget in which annual report, but he says, hey, here's the amount of shares you should yeah. you could sell. And so I, I think, too, it's always important to remember that even though a company doesn't have a payout ratio or they directly give you a dividend, that you, know, you can kind of finagle it through your own Stats crafting. And cash out yeah, it. absolutely. All right, moving on for the game today. We're trying out a new game. I right, that's you're what the, I'm here for. You're the guinea pig for today. As the game is called Stock Quiz. Yep. That's the name for now. We might rebrand it. But okay. Is that name cool? With I you? like that. All right. The, the game is we'll pose a scenario here. There will be either multiple choice or true and false. You've thought of two questions. I've thought of one. We don't know the... I haven't told you the answer. You haven't told me. So this is all It's purely organic. Here, here we go. We're going crazy here. Here's the first scenario. This is one of yours for me. Why don't you read it off? Yeah. So the first question, Bank of America issued more credit cards in 2013 than it did in 2012 and 2011 combined. True or false, David? I know you wanted to stump me, but I'm going to say true. Uh, the credit card business at Bank of America, I think, has exploded. Correct. Hopefully in a good way for them in 2013. Is it true? So it's actually false. Really? Um, yeah, but so so they issued in 2011 and 2012 a total of 6.3 million in new credit cards mm -hmm. and then 3.9 in 2013. Ooh. So still a good number though. When you think about it, that essentially they've uh, gone up 30% since 2011 in annual yeah. cards issued. But one of the really interesting things I found was that their risk-adjusted margin. So you hear it's like, I think with credit cards, you always think like, oh no, does that Wait, mean they're just giving all away credit cards? Yeah, yeah. So their risk-adjusted margin in 2011, it stood at 5.8 percent on mm -hmm. each credit card, but then in 2013, it stood at 8.7 percent. So they're issuing 30 percent more, and they're also making essentially a 50 percent higher return. So it seems like a, a compelling thing. Seems that their credit card business is interesting. All right. Well, you stumped me on that one. Going to my scenario. For you, the question is, eBay's marketplace revenue has grown at an annualized rate of blank since 2010. And the options are 5%, 8%, 13%. Wow. OK, that, my, my gut tells me 13% just because I, I know that eBay, I think they've really hit on that where they've said that their marketplace business are making a lot more sales. But gosh, 13% would be truly, an, I mean, that means it would have almost doubled since 2010, so. You are right. Wow. It is 13%. And I know we're not going to get into the marketplace business too much. That yeah. really, We'll leave that for the, the tech guys to do. But we talk about eBay on here because of the PayPal, mm -hmm. the fight with Carl Icahn right now. Yeah. And I think it just points out that, yes, they're growing at a different rate. The PayPal business is growing at a faster rate than the marketplace. But the marketplace business isn't some dog that's no, losing not, market not market by by the day here. So I thought that was just an interesting point to say that it is still growing at 13% a year. It slowed down a little bit, but still 13% annualized the last several years is impressive. Yeah, for sure. That's that's kind of stunning. All right, final question. Yep. So here we go. The last question. In 2013, U.S. Bank Corp returned blank percent of its profits to shareholders through dividends and buybacks. And the options a, are? Yes, yeah, 66%, 71%, or 62%. I'm going to go with 71%. Wow, David, right on the money. Great so, job there. So 71%, pretty incredible it, when you compare that to yeah, the Bank of America. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Bank of America, that's funny you mentioned them. Yeah, I think, I, I, I can't recall exactly the percent of repurchases that they mm -hmm. had, but their dividend payout was like four four and a half percent yeah. or something something relatively mm -hmm. low. But whereas US Bank Corps, uh, they made five point eight billion in total net income and then they returned seventy one percent of it. Uh, so forty two percent of that was in the form of share repurchases and then another twenty nine percent in the form of dividends back to their shareholders. So a little over $4 billion wow. back in the pockets of shareholders. On the Bank of America, I want to say off the top of my head, I'm not positive, but net income was, what, $11 billion for yeah. 2013? I think I read they repurchased around $3 billion okay. in shares. So Still friendly there. 27-ish, 26-ish percent uh, buyback rate there. So Yeah. All right. And it, it's, yeah, U.S. Bank Corp. Great business. Stock quiz, should we keep the game around? I like, like that. Yeah, All I'll right. keep trying to drum up a good name for it. <laughs> All right. Finishing off on the Twitter sphere. Let's do it. Final tweet of the day. The only tweet of the day, right? Uh, yeah. From Sports Illustrated. It says, 2014 NFL oh, draft rumors. 
Houston Texans leaning towards drafting Jadavion Clowney. Patrick, you are a graduate of University of South Carolina. My are you happy? Of Gamecocks. Oh, you absolutely. Happy? I think the, the really great thing about Clowney, I mean, I watched every South Carolina game. People have said, oh, his numbers aren't as great or anything like that. I mean, it was fascinating. Re like, teams wouldn't run to the left side of their offense. Clowney was there. And you could say, like, oh, maybe he was, you know, he looked like he took plays off or anything mm -hmm. like that. He is... I mean, just has a great heart, seems to always be taking on a, a lot of effort. And, you know, if you're being triple teamed on every play where you have a it's left tackle and a running back and a tight end coming after you. And then plus, I think the Texans, it'd be a great move. You have J.J. Watt on the other side. Boom. Clowney was faster than all but like five wide receivers. That's terrifying. If I'm the Texans, that's what I want. Andrew Luck, he would be scared. I told everyone that Patrick covers everything from fool.com. Look at this. We got Mel Kiper type draft. Hey, that's what I'm here for. <clears throat> Very Impressive. If only All right. my hair was looked as good as Mel's. If only. If All only. right. That is our show for today. You can find us on Twitter. Yep. We are at TMF Financials. You can find us on Facebook, Motley Fool Financial Sector Coverage. You can email us, WTMI at fool.com. We will see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and the Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.